Hi, I'm Sebastian from Ironskin and we're here at Fest de Coburg near Nuremberg in Germany. We are here with the 10 pieces that people have sent in and they are pieces of chainmail that they handcrafted themselves and we are gonna put them to the test. We will shoot at the pieces with crossbows of various strengths and see do the bolts go through, do the rings get deformed and how do they look like. That's the first out of a couple tests in this competition. We have 14 participants from nine different countries, out of which 12 qualified to be tested. The first piece to test was made by Matthias Zimmermann from Germany. We embedded the test pieces into a larger male shirt to give it more rings to pull at and let it develop the full mesh behavior that male armor has. What you see here is Andreas Bichler from the Medieval Crossbows channel. He's shooting at our test pieces with a late medieval crossbow of 220 kg, respectively 485 pounds. Can the pieces of mail stand against his bolts of 45 grams, almost 2 ounces? This bolt went into the surrounding ring mesh. You see that it penetrated and then bounced off the dummy of cloth underneath. We were using these silver butted rings to mount the test piece. The shock of the bolt was so strong that it made this connection undone. It's a good demonstration of how much the larger ring mesh is involved, not just the rings that get hit directly. Matthias' piece got three direct hits. One was cutting through a solid ring, one broke a solid and a riveted ring, and one just damaged a riveted ring near the left edge where it could glide off into the gap between the shirt and the test piece. Next is Janni Tila from Sweden. The bolts were hitting two times and cut through two rings each. At this point we realized that the butted rings were not enough to connect the test pieces to the male shirt. So we changed it for a connection with wire rods. Now you see the piece of Paul Dullis from Germany. Paul's piece had this magic aura that just made the bolts land slightly below. Yet finally we did manage to hit one direct shot. The bolt broke one ring and left cut marks on two other rings. This is Robert Johnson from USA. One shot broke a ring and heavily damaged two neighbors. The other shot went near the edge and broke off a ring. Next is Asher Terry from USA. When the bolt hit his mail, it only bent the ring a little and left some cut marks. Yet it bounced off completely. With the other hit, it slightly opened one ring's rivet connection. And it bounced off too. A third hit near the edge did break a single ring and distorted two neighbors. This is the piece of Marco Faccio from Italy. He had one shot that took out two rings. You can also see the cut on a neighboring ring. Another shot hit near the edge and it broke one ring. Then we have Murayu Alexandru Mihai from Romania. His shot caused a white hole with three rings broken. At this point the day came to an end and we had to ration the shots that we had left before it turned to dark. This is Sam Chin from Australia. Only the core of riveted rings is his creation. Sam had difficulty with building and shipping his piece in time all the way from Australia to Germany. I added a surrounding mesh of riveted and solid rings to make it larger. With his creation being so small, it was difficult to hit and we needed seven near misses. One hit near the edge broke one ring out of Sam's mesh. Another hit in the center took out two of his rings. Then we got to shoot at the elaborate mesh of Maurice Patlo from USA. We are looking at rings with an inner diameter of 4.6 mm here. That's smaller than the cross section of a pencil. The direct hit removed two of his rings. In contrast to that stands Christian Hafner from Germany with his large and massive rings. At first the bolt went through the sleeve of the male shirt and penetrated both layers. Would his rings offer more resistance than the commercial rings around? Christian got one hit that destroyed two rings. In the ballistic test, Asher Terry was the only one who had bolts bouncing off without them opening a ring. Two points for Asher, zero points for everyone else. 
The second part of this competition is to compare our creations with male armor from history. Most of the participants set out to build their own rings as a form of art. They had their tools and workflow grooved in before the competition was even announced. Only then they started to look out for museum pieces. Yet here I want to incentivize participants to follow the originals. So as a collective we learn to understand them. In this part you get points from 0 to a maximum of 3. Those who have a specific historic idol and followed it get more points. Those who sent me on a mission to look for comparable pieces get fewer points. Please keep in mind that this is all for the sake of having someone on YouTube commenting on these rings. I'm not the master of the universe, what I'm going to say is just a more or less educated opinion. And it's going to be biased and not necessarily fair. Please help me out in the comments and add your opinion. Matthias Zimmermann from Germany wanted his mail to be compared with an original that he restored. Its age is ambiguous. It was altered at different times in history. Yet we will look at these rings now and attribute them to the 14th century or earlier. They are riveted and solid. The rivets look like wedges. And so do Matthias's rings. That means full three points for his work. Matthias kindly provided even more photos for us. You can find them on the museum section on ironskin.com. Next is Christian Hafner from Germany. He was experimenting a lot with rings in the past. Out of his personal variety, he handed in these chunky rings, so we would have something extraordinary to test. At the time when he was making them, he had no specific museum piece to look at. These rings from the Swedish Royal Armouries look somewhat comparable. Yet then, there's always a lucky find if you look long enough. Zero point for Christian, but a huge thank you to him and my dearest appreciation. He could have just chosen a more accurate sheet. Marco Faccio is from Italy and Italian pieces from the 16th century are what we are going to compare with. I like how Marco's rivets are half domed on one side and flush on the other side, much like the museum pieces from Florence. The museum rings show more of a rich line on the back and the rivets are rather wedges than his pins. Two points for Marco. Maurice Padlow from USA. What can I say? His mail just made me fall in love. There are 2200 rings in this piece. When you touch it, it feels liquid. I know about Maurice that he sees his mail as a work of art. His art, not an imitation of history. There are some rare examples of brass rivets. So I found an example for you, Maurice. Still, this means zero point in this historical comparison. It would be a hundred points if this was a beauty competition. I'm deeply touched that you have sent me this masterpiece. From Sweden we have Janni Tila. His rings are flush on one side, half domed on the other. The rivets are a cylindrical piece of wire pressed together with a lot of force. Sometimes the rivets are bent a little to the side like clamps. Janni and I didn't quite know what to compare with. In the end, I chose this photo from the Swedish Royal Armouries. Yet if at all, it's a lucky shot. So, zero points here. Romania is represented by Muraju Alexandru Mihai. He wants his mail to be compared with late medieval rings. He pointed me towards multiple museum pieces that we both don't have close-up photos of. So we are looking at these instead. The original rings have small rivets and they are flush on one side. Most often they are flat. He has bulky dome rivets on both sides. We'll give one point for trying to look at specific originals. Next is Robert Johnson from USA. His rings shall be compared with examples in the Metropolitan Museum New York. I like how he matches the general proportions. The original rings are elevated like a ridge near the rivet and on the back side they are flush. I would like to have seen wedge rivets here. One point for Robert. From Australia we have Sam Chin participating. He got vaguely inspired by 16th century pieces. Again, some pieces look somewhat like this. Wedge rivets would have been appropriate. One point for Sam. 
this is from Asher Terry from USA. He wants to be compared with rings from the 15th century. His wedge rivets are spot on, slim and firm. Three points for Asher. Paul Dullis from Germany made rings that aren't too different from Asher's. He was using slightly thinner wire. Paul flattened his ring a bit more and he made very small and precise overlaps. He wants to be compared with rings in the 16th century male capes, specifically this one. And I call this a success. Three points for Paul. And here comes Mike Cervantes from USA with his beautiful smooth rings with pin rivets. There are historic examples that somewhat look like this if you look long enough, yet Mike didn't build it to match one of them. Instead, he built marvelous rings with their own beauty. Still, this means zero points in the historic comparison. Last but not least is Inokenti Orden with his recreation of the mail from Jermundbu. Jermundbu is a famous grave find from Viking Age Norway. Here you see the original rings and a digital visualization. There are riveted and solid rings with inner diameter of roughly 7mm. I find Inukenti's rings matching quite nicely. Let's honor this with 3 points. Stretch test. We have measured the weight that was necessary to crack individual rings. Now obviously rings are stronger when you build them chunky from thick wire. But that means additional weight. That's not fair to compare with the lightweight meshes. After all, one could just use two layers of lightweight mail if it has the same weight as one layer of heavy mail. So we will be looking at how well a piece of mail performs in relation to its weight per area. First, let's look at the ring's dimensions. Most participants built the rings with an inner diameter of 7 or 8 mm. Only Maurice Padlow went to extremes with 4.6 mm inner diameter. And participants chose their wire from 1.1 mm to 1.8 mm with Christian Hafner selecting the strongest wire. The test pieces typically have around 700 or 800 rings each. Think about that. Each ring takes a minute or two to make. On the extreme end, there is Maurice Padlow with the insane amount of 2250 rings. Sam Chin only has 295 rings because his sample was smaller. We weighed and measured all pieces. And we took great care to stretch the mail evenly when I measured the area. From that we can calculate the weight per area. That gives us how heavy a piece feels. Let's multiply that by almost 2 and we get about the weight that a full shirt of mail would weigh. You find Murayu Alexandru Mihai being the lightest. His shirt would weigh 12 kg, respectively 26 pounds. Maurice Padlow with his tiny rings would have a shirt weighing 21 kg 46 pounds if he gets to finish it in the year 2099. I'm joking. That's the same weight as Mike Cervantes' mail with two times larger rings. The only mail heavier than that is from Asher Terry with 28 kg 62 pounds for a shirt. Surprisingly, the mail of Christian Hafner looks heavy, but with 16 kg 35 pounds, it's not far away from the lighter ones. His overlaps are very short and his rivets are very small. Yet how well did the rings perform in the stress test compared to their own weight? For that I divided the endured weight by the weight per area. As a result I got this strength factor rounded to whole numbers. The number here also means the points that you get from the stress test. First are the rings of Murayu Alexandru Mihai from Romania. Two rings broke with the rivet slipping out of the rivet hole. Matthias Zimmermann from Germany has solid and wedge riveted rings. The solid rings stayed intact. The riveted rings deformed and pulled the rivet out of the rivet hole. This is Mike Cervantes from USA with his pin riveted rings. His rivets could not get pulled out. Instead, his rings got torn at the overlap near the rivet hole. 
These are the rings with wedge rivets made by Asher Terry from USA. Again, the rings got opened by the rivet getting pulled out. This is the mail from Inokenti Orden with riveted and solid rings. The solid rings stayed intact. The riveted rings got torn near the overlap. Let's look at Sam Chin from Australia. We have another case of tearing near the rivet hole. How about Janitila from Sweden? He's using pin rivets and they stand strong while the ring itself is tearing apart. Now to the bulky rings of Christian Hafner from Germany. They broke in an entirely different way. The rings stayed intact. The rivets stayed in place. Yet with a lot of force the rivets broke in half. His rivets are from a significantly smaller wire than the rings themselves. Here comes Robert Johnson from USA. He had a mixture of twice a torn overlap and once a slipping rivet. These are the pin riveted rings by Marco Faccio from Italy. His rings broke with a torn overlap similar to Mike Cervantes rings. Paul Dullis from Germany has wedge riveted rings. For one ring the overlap got torn apart and twice the rivet slipped. Maurice Padlow from USA was going beyond our expectation in so many ways. His rings were too small for the hook so we had to tie them onto. The rings broke by tearing apart. Last but not least comes Dylan White from Canada. He is not formally taking part in the competition, but he wanted to make us happy by sending in this piece of mail made out of jump rings. Surprisingly, it got pulled apart easily. The force needed was comparable to the riveted rings. We see the best performance by Christian Hafner with his tiny dome rivets, closely followed by Paul Dullis with his wedge rivets. An honorable mention goes to Robert Johnson, not too far off. All three of them seem to have in common that their overlaps are short but precisely shaped, and their rivets are comparably lightweight. With a couple hundred rings such weight savings add up. Let's sum up all the points of the competition and find a winner. Before that, a quick word about our sponsor. Nah, I'm kidding. I just want to say thank you to participant Nicolas Marino Veliz from Chile, whose package didn't arrive in time. Third prize goes to Christian Hafner from Germany. He will get this t-shirt with riveted mail pattern, known from the Iron Skin shop. The second prize, this cute little anvil, goes to Asher Terry from USA. And the first prize is the book European Mail Armor. It is, with no exaggeration, the Bible of chainmail. The author, Martin Weinthoven, has left you a personal note on the first page. And the winner of this first and only international chainmail competition is... Drumroll! Paul Dullis from Germany. Congratulations! Thank you everyone for participating. All your mail is strong and beautiful. You are special for the fact that you built this. We pulled this off with your help. Have a look into the video description below to find a link to the people involved.